O、oh、God, this is a branch sprung from the tree of Thy mercy. Through Thy grace and bounty, enable him to grow, and through the showers of Thy generosity, cause him to be a verdant, flourishing, blossoming, and fruitful branch. Gladden the eyes of his parents, thou who giveth to whomsoever thou willest, and bestow upon him the name Shogi, so that he may yearn for thy kingdom and soar into the realms of the unseen. Abdu'l-Bahá. The family of Abdul Baha lived for decades amidst the severe privations of the prison city of Akka. It was a hard life for anyone, especially children. Many died, including the sons of Abdul Baha. Thus, there must have been happiness in the household on March 1, 1897, when Abdul Baha's eldest daughter, Ziaya Hanun, and her husband Mirza Hadi Shirazi Afnan. Gave birth to their first son. The child was given the name Shogi, the one who yearns. As a young child, Shogi Effendi was small, sensitive, and intensely active. His mother often had cause to worry over his health, but he grew up to have an iron constitution, which, coupled with the phenomenal force of his nature and willpower, Enabled him to overcome every obstacle in his path. Shogi Effendi was reared in the house of Abdul Baha in Haifa, and received the best education possible. Under Abdul Baha's supervision, he attended the Jesuit school, the most reputable in the city. Unhappy there, he transferred to the Syrian Protestant College, later known as the American University of Beirut. Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1918, as a young scholar, one of Shogi Effendi's greatest interests was geography. He became a prolific maker of maps, a talent which he later used to chart the progress of the cause throughout the Western world. In the spring of 1920, Shogi Effendi left Haifa for England, where he studied at Balliol College, Oxford. During his time at Oxford, he distinguished himself as a peerless scholar of English. His translations of the sacred writings from Persian and Arabic attain a standard which will never be surpassed. In frequent letters written to Abdul Baha, Shogi Effendi described his desire to serve the faith, saying, "I am directing and concentrating all my efforts on my studies." And doing my utmost to acquire that which will benefit and prepare me to serve the cause in the days to come. My hope is that I may speedily acquire the best that this country and this society have to offer, and then return to my home and recast the truths of the faith in a new form, and thus serve the holy threshold. While in England. Shogi Effendi often visited the Bahais of Manchester, one of England's earliest Bahai communities. When not in school, he would return to Haifa and spend time with his beloved grandfather, serving as a secretary and translator of his tablets. During these visits, Shogi Effendi met with many pilgrims and distinguished Bahais, who spoke of the progress of the faith in both the East and the West. Amatul Baha Rahia Hanum shares her memories of Shogi Effendi. The guardian was、uh, always very dear to the heart of Abdul Baha. He was his eldest grandson, and of course, the first will of Abdul Baha, because he wrote three wills, what we call the will and testament of Abdul Baha, is in three different sections. 
And very early, I think the first uh, intimation of the guardianship, if I remember, was when Shogi Fendi was about 12 years old. But then, of course, nobody knew. This was very secret. Um, you know, Abdul Baha, I don't think many of the Baha'is realize Abdul Baha had some sons. Some of them died in infancy, and one son died, I think, when he was three or four years old. And um, then he was left with these four daughters, and three of them married, and one of them never, uh, one, the fourth one also married, but never had any children. Three of them had children. And he had um, 13 grandchildren. And Shogi Fendi was the eldest grandchild from the eldest daughter of Abdul Baha. And of course, he showed what it says in the Will and Testament that the, the child is the secret essence of the sire. And Shogi Fendi showed in himself these characteristics that were inherited from the master. In other words, there was no doubt about it, that he was a different type from the others, different caliber. And he was very, very heartbroken, you see, after the passing of Abdul Baha. The master died when he was in London. He, I don't know whether the Baha'is realize to what an extent it affects him. Tudor Pole, who was an Englishman, a great friend of the master, an admirer of the master, sent for Shoghi Effendi from Oxford to come to London. And he had received word from Haifa, because he was the correspondent for the Baha'is in England, that Abdul Baha had passed away. So he sent for Shoghi Effendi to come and tell him this. And uh, the guardian was in his office, and for a moment he went, as I understood, into another room. And lying on the table, right, so to speak, in front of his eyes, he didn't make any effort to poke his nose around, but he saw this cable with the word Abdul Baha in it, and he said that Abdul Baha had ascended, you see, and he fainted. You, Tudor Pole came into the room, and the guardian was unconscious on the floors. It was such a terrible, terrible shock to him. Well, that was shock number one. Then shock number two was when they read the Will and Testament, which, as I said before, he anticipated that his eldest grandson, he might be asked to read the will, to open it, break the seals. He found that he had been made it, so to speak. He was the head of the faith and the successor of Abdul Baha. And he had a terrible time coming to terms with that. And I think that the mountains meant something to him. He could, he could uh, commune with his own spirit, I suppose. I don't know. I wasn't in him or with him. But I suppose he had to come to grips with it. He had to commune with his own spirit and uh, find a way to go back to Haifa and face the responsibility of a whole Baha'i religion that depended on his guidance as a successor of Abdul Baha, which is a terrific thing, you see. And he fled from it more than once, literally fled from it. They had to come and, and beg him, the greatest holy leaf sent for him, and, and, and begged him to come back. I can remember when my mother and I said goodbye to Shoghi Effendi, and he called us to his bedroom, and he was lying in bed. And there was just the thing I can remember, he was this young man, and nothing but eyes. He was so wan, you see, and worn out with this um, shock that had come to him, and the terrible responsibility, and the beginning of fermentation amongst the covenant breakers, you see. It never left the Baha'i faith. Thank heaven the House of Justice hasn't had this problem, but up till the end of the Guardian's life, the Bab had defection, Baha'u'llah had defection, Abdul Baha had defection to deal with, Shoghi Effendi had defection to deal with, you see. And it just prostrated him. And he told my mother and me, he said, you know, Mrs. Maxwell, I can't stand it, I'm leaving. And as I say, more than once, he literally fled to the mountains of Switzerland and walked in the wilderness, I suppose, trying to come to grips with his grief and with his responsibility. Tremendous thing. 
And then he just had this great love for the mountains and love for Switzerland, love nature, but particularly the mountains. And I remember he told me that on one occasion he had walked over two of the great Swiss passes and that it had rained very hard and he got drenched to the skin and that by the time he walked down that pass and up the other pass he was all dried off I suppose from the wind, the sun perhaps and from his own body heat from climbing and from walking yet as I said a particular love for this country The history of this uh, building is really extraordinary. In uh, 1890, approximately, Baha'u'llah came here, visited Haifa, sat here amongst those trees, and told his son Abdul Baha, bring the body of the Bab, which had been hidden for 60 years in Persia, and bury it here, buy this land and bury it here. Abdul Baha did this. He was a prisoner of the Turks. He was sometimes very strictly confined in the prison city of Akka. But he managed to buy this property. Although he had practically just emerged from his imprisonment, to come and bury the remains of the Bab in six rooms of this building which he had constructed. Very simple rooms, but very firmly and well built. And he entombed the remains of the Bab that had been brought from Persia in 1909. In 1928, Shoghi Fendi added three more rooms here at the back because he knew that it had to be symmetrical, nine rooms with the body of the Bab in the center. And then in 1944, he unveiled the plan for the superstructure of the tomb of the Bab. My father was a very famous Canadian architect, and he was living here with Shoghi Effendi and me during the war and after the war. And the guardian said, I want you to design this structure of the Bab shrine. It was unveiled in 1944, and it was a very uh, precious occasion, and then Shoghi Effendi announced that the model for the shrine of the Bab had been chosen, and he began the construction of this work in 1946. And all of this Shoghi Effendi supervised himself. I can't go into the details, but he had the whole project carried out directly under his supervision. He used to come, it was in war years when we had no pilgrims, used to come and stand here 
and direct the laborers with the excavation. We even had our own railway in front of the shrine to fill the dump in at the other end. But eventually, this wonderful building was finished in 1953. I don't think that the Baha'is appreciate the fact that this monument of the sister of Abdul Baha, the greatest holy leaf, Bahia Khanum, is really the hub of all of this development that we are looking at at the present time on Mount Carmel, except for the shrine of the Bab, which is, of course, the fixed point of the forerunner of the Baha'i faith. What people don't understand is that this tremendous love and respect that Chogi Fendi had for his great aunt, for the sister of Abdul Baha, his beloved grandfather, and the fact that he instructed that she should be buried here on Mount Carmel was the point of the development of this entire ark. Shogi Fendi, first of all, had, when he was absent, his great aunt died. He was heartbroken, and he instructed exactly where she should be buried. Then, after my marriage, many, many years later, I think it was in 1941, if I remember correctly, he brought the mother and brother of his aunt, the greatest holy leaf, to be buried here on Mount Carmel, because she said, I always want to be buried next to my mother. And instead of taking the mother, the, the greatest holy leaf, over to the mother in the cemetery of Akka, which was really a horrible place, he exhumed the remains of the mother and the brother and brought them and built two more little Greek love temples, if you like, on top of their resting places. And eventually, his grandmother, the wife of Abdul Baha, was buried in this fourth grave. So that this is a cemetery. And I think it's very significant that what seems to be a place of light and beauty and joy and love is the center of a graveyard. And I think that one has to realize that the guardian himself laid all of these gardens out. He chose the position. He, with his own hands, I was present the night that he entombed these remains here with so much reverence and respect, and hundreds of Baha'is uh, in torchlight gathered around while they were buried here. This place is so full of not only history, but of significance. Shoghi Fendi did almost everything himself. The interesting thing about this archives, which is the Museum of Baha'i Historic Objects, is that it was uh, not only designed, as you can see in the Greek style, based roughly on the proportions of the Parthenon, but uh, Shoghi Fendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, did something I have never seen before in my life. He developed the whole garden in front of the building before it was built. And he built the building from the back into the empty space towards the front. So that when the building was completed, the whole garden was completed in front of it and the trees were growing and everything was beautiful. And he lived to see this. He didn't live to see uh, himself to furnish the interior, but he lived to see this beautiful building that was really his conception. The architect said, I have nothing to do with this building. This building was designed by Shoghi Effendi. And it set the pace for all of these buildings on the Ark. What I don't think the Baha'is realize is that these gardens are the manifestation of the most extraordinary sense of proportion. Proportion is beauty. And Shoghi Fendi had this wonderful sense of proportion. You see it in the monuments, these beautiful graves. You see it in this building, which is surely something that if he had been alive, he would have approved of because it is typical Greek in style. You see it in the gardens that he laid out. 
You see it in his writings. All of this work on these gardens he did himself. He had very little money. So every year he would do one section of the gardens according to his possibilities. And that's the charm of them, that they're not laid out like Versailles or one of the famous gardens of the world, all in one block like a landscape gardener. They are something that grew piece by piece. And this is the entire charm of the gardens. He used to stand here by the hour. He had all these palm trees planted by measurement by hand. He used to tell the gardeners, make a vajab. This is a vajab in Arabic, a span. He'd say, Me measure five vajabs. So the gardener would go along like that where there was five. Then he'd say, plant the tree there. He said, make the path one meter 20 wide. Make the steps into the embankment, so and so many steps. He used to ask me, how many steps do you think we need? And I would make him a paper model. And then he could see how the steps would look in one of these banks of flowers that he was working on. But he did the whole thing himself. And he did it at, at great economy because he was spending the money of the Baha'is of the world. And it's an example, frankly, to all of us.